In this video, we're going to cover uniform circular motion. Uniform motion is motion at a constant speed. So an object is in uniform circular motion when it moves at a constant speed along a circular path. Just like in other 2D kinematics, the velocity of an object is always tangent to the path, which in this case is a circle. The position of the object is always a distance r, or the radius, away from the center of the circle. Since our objects in uniform circular motion will have a constant speed, we can easily find how fast it is moving. Speed is just distance over time. When an object has gone around its circular path one complete revolution, or one full time, it has traveled a distance equal to the circumference of that circle. The time to complete one full revolution we will give a special name called the period. We will represent this time with a capital T rather than a lowercase t. Putting this together, we get the tangential speed to be 2 pi r divided by the period. Since an object moving along a circular path will always be the same distance from the center, instead of using x and y coordinates to state the position of the object, it is easier to describe the position using an angle theta that the object makes with the x-axis. In addition to measuring our angles in degrees, we can also use radians. The angle in radians is defined to be the arc length subtended or swept out by the angle divided by the radius. Notice that both the arc length s and the radius r have units of length, and therefore these units will cancel. So radians are not a real unit, but rather a ratio of these two lengths. If we use this formula and then put the circumference of a circle as the arc length, the radius will cancel, and we find that the total angle swept out by a full circle is 2 pi radians. This gives a way to convert between revolutions, radians, and degrees. One revolution is equal to 2 pi radians and is also equal to 360 degrees. We often write this formula above as s equals r times theta, but it's good to remember this as the definition of theta in radians. This is because we must remember not to use angles in degrees unless it's appropriate. We want to use and be consistent with all of the definitions we have already in kinematics, and we want to build on the intuition that we already have. So here, instead of displacement in x or y, we will define an angular displacement delta theta. We will measure the initial and final angles counterclockwise relative to the positive x-axis. The actual distance, or arc length, moved through will be the radius times the angular displacement using the equations we just saw. For all circular motion, counterclockwise motion will be positive and we'll call clockwise motion negative. We can also define angular velocity omega as we did with linear velocity, now just using angular displacement over time. The instantaneous angular velocity can be defined in terms of a derivative as well. In this case, average and instantaneous velocity will be the same. The average angular velocity and instantaneous angular velocity will be the same since it is constant. Since the object will be moving through the same distance per time, the angle the object sweeps through will also be constant with time. For a full circle, the angular velocity is an angular displacement of 2 pi radians divided by the period t. This is very similar to our equation for tangential speed we saw before. And if we multiply by a factor of the radius on both sides, we get the tangential speed is equal to the angular velocity omega times the radius. This gives us a way to convert back and forth between the linear tangential speed and the angular speed. Now an object moving along a circular path will always be changing direction, and therefore it must always be accelerating. Since the speed is not changing and only the direction of velocity is changing, we know the acceleration must be perpendicular to the velocity at any given time. So we'll do a little bit of analysis to try and get an equation for the magnitude of this acceleration. And if we look at the velocity at two subsequent moments in time that are very close to each other, these velocities will form a right triangle. Both have a length equal to the tangential speed, and they differ by an angle delta theta. We can see that taking the first velocity vector and adding a small change perpendicular to its direction graphically gives us the next velocity vector. Remember, we're zooming in very close on the circle. The closer we look, the arc of the circle will begin to look more and more straight. The slice of our circle we looked at when we related the arc length, radius, and angle will begin to look more and more like the thin right triangle that we have here. So we'll use that relationship. In this case, delta v is our arc length, and tangential speed plays the role of the radius. This gives us the change in velocity is equal to the tangential speed times the small angular displacement. We'll leave this here for just a second. Now we can write the tangential speed as the radius times the angular velocity and replace the angular velocity with delta theta over delta t from its definition. Here we'll rearrange for delta t. 
Now we're almost ready to find acceleration, but let's first look at the direction while we have this picture. When our tangential velocity is going up, the change in velocity is to the left, so the acceleration will also point to the left. We can do this again at the top of the circle where the velocity is to the left. Here the change of velocity points down, so the acceleration is down. And if we keep going, we find the acceleration is always toward the center of the circle. We call this centripetal acceleration or radial acceleration. Centripetal means center seeking, and radial just means along the radius of the circle. For this reason, we will add a subscript C for centripetal or a subscript R or RAD to specify this type of radial acceleration. If we look at a velocity vector given by the white arrow and a blue acceleration vector, we can imagine moving the acceleration vector to the tip of the velocity vector, and then imagine the acceleration is pushing the velocity to change. The velocity vector will start to turn, and if the acceleration maintains perpendicular, the velocity will move in a circle. So now that we have the direction of radial acceleration, let's take the equation we just found to get the magnitude. We solved for the small change in velocity and the small change in time. Since acceleration is the change in velocity over time, we'll just divide. Here the change in angle will cancel, and the tangential speed on bottom will come up to the numerator. This gives us the magnitude of radial acceleration as the tangential speed squared divided by the radius. We also have a way to go back and forth between tangential and angular speed that we saw before, v equals r times omega. Plugging this in, we can write the radial acceleration as omega squared times r. Since we've seen and played around with many equations so far, let's summarize what we found. The arc length and angular displacement are related by this equation, where we rearranged our definition of our angle in radians. The tangential velocity, or tangential speed, can either be written as distance over time, which in this case is the circumference over the period, or we can write it in terms of the angular speed omega. Radial acceleration is always inward along the radius of our circular path, and the magnitude can be found using the tangential speed or the angular speed. You may hear me use the words speed and velocity interchangeably here, and I really mean the magnitude of velocity. Though the direction of velocity is always changing, it is always tangent to the circle, and the acceleration is always perpendicular. So the relative directions remain the same. This means the motion at any point on the circle looks the same as at every other point. If you rotate the circle I've drawn here, it wouldn't change anything. Every point still looks the same. So we can really just imagine freezing the object at some point along its motion and look at its velocity and acceleration at that time. Then speed and velocity are really the same thing at that moment anyway. This is why definitions are important. If you know how we defined our quantities, you can recognize a scenario when speed and velocity are the same, for example. Otherwise, you may get really confused when the language is different or you use words interchangeably. I'll try to be consistent and technically correct, but this is just in case you notice differences in how I describe things. This is all we'll look at in terms of uniform circular motion for now. We'll revisit this soon when we discuss the forces that cause motion like this along with other motion we see in kinematics. And then we'll look at non-uniform circular motion. So that's it for this video, and I'll see you in the next one.